All right, welcome everybody um, to this uh, Meta Science 2023 virtual symposium uh, towards objective indicators of trustworthiness of research findings, lessened, le lessons learned in the Transparent Sci project. Uh, I'm Tom Hardwick, uh, research fellow at the University of Melbourne, and I'm hosting this session on behalf of AMOS, the Association for Interdisciplinary Meta Research and Open Science. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and pay respect to the elders and descendants of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been and are the custodians of the land where I am speaking to you from. Uh, and I'll also uh, take the opportunity here to uh, advertise the uh, the AMOS annual conference, um, which is taking place in Brisbane, Australia this year between 21st and the 23rd of November. Um, so for updates on that and all of the uh, AMOS related news, you can follow us on Twitter um, or Mastodon um, and you can join our mailing list on the website uh, amos.community. So uh, today's session will last for 90 minutes. Um, if you'd like to ask a question of the panel, then please do so using the, uh, the Q&A function, and, and then I will um, forward those questions to the panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists now, and then I'll hand over to, uh, to them for the remainder of the session. So um, we have, let's get this list up, uh, Reno Evra, Evra um, from the University of Lorraine. Uh, Marcel Van Assen from the Meta Research Center at Tilburg University. Jakob Jolle uh, from the Association of Dutch Research Universities and the University of Groningen. Patricio Tresoldi of the University of Padova. Eric Jan Wagenmakers of the Psychological Methods Unit at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, David Vernon, who I'm not sure is here yet, but hopefully will be soon, um, from Canterbury Christchurch University. And uh, finally, uh, Zoltan Kakech of the uh, ELTA Institute of Psychology. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Zoltan now, who will guide you through the rest of today's session. So uh, over to you, Zoltan. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, so thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I would like to share my screen and uh, you should be able to see uh, my screen now. So um, in this session, we are going to talk about the Transparent C project, uh, which is a uh, um, large scale multi-site application of uh, Daryl BAM's uh, 2011 um, experiment one, but it is uh, much more than that. So I will start with a very brief introduction of the project, and then uh, we will start uh, the discussion with the panel members. Uh, at first, with uh, some questions that uh, we kind of uh, jointly formulated uh, before the conference, uh, and then uh, I will turn it uh, over to the audience questions as well. So we will continue discussing uh, throughout that. Um, so let's start with this uh, brief intro of the project. In the uh, old days, we were doing uh, research studies uh, almost completely in the dark. Uh, we did research planning, recruitment, study execution, data management, and analysis uh, almost in isolation, maybe discussing with a few colleagues and then uh, revealing uh, these studies and the results only at the publication phase. Uh, after the uh, reformist movement uh, and the replication crisis, there were a few solutions to the uh, decreased reproducibility and uh, pre-registration, registered reports and uh, uh, open materials, open data uh, became uh, um, best practices, if not uh, mainstream yet, but uh, definitely recommended best practices. And with, with these, uh, we have started to open up this research process we are uh, able to be very transparent about uh, our research plans uh, or data analysis uh, to some extent. Uh, and uh, also at the results and publication phase, we are more transparent with the uh, open data and open materials. Uh, but uh, uh, we are still uh, not 
transparent, uh, or we are still doing uh, most of the research execution in the dark. Uh, the recruitment, the uh, experimentation itself, and the data management is still uh, not, uh, we, we, are, we are not able to demonstrate uh, its integrity. So in this uh, transparency gap, uh, there are a lot of things that could happen. Uh, you could just uh, restart your study as many times as you want until you get your desired result. Uh, you could uh, do, uh, or do, you could exclude outliers, those pesky outliers that stand between you and uh, a significant p-value. You could just simply fabricate uh, data, enter data yourself into a spreadsheet, and uh, nobody will uh, know uh, with uh, just using these uh, previously uh, proposed uh, uh, best practices. Uh, or you could just uh, do a regular study in the old, old way. Uh, you could have 100 dependent variables, see which ones are significant, and then retrospectively pre-register uh, your uh, study. Um, and uh, only those five variables that were significant or only those analyses uh, res uh, that, that produced the significant re results. Uh, so if you think that uh, this is like, uh, some of these are clear indications of fraud uh, and uh, we shouldn't be too worried about it uh, because they are very rare uh, and only a very small minority of researchers would result to these uh, think again. So in, in medical research, for example, uh, Hariman uh, indicated that uh, there's a 67% of medical research which is ret retrospectively pre-registered and uh, retrospectively pre-registered label was only put on studies where the registration was submitted on the day or after the day of submission of the paper. So uh, this is only, only the tip of the iceberg. It doesn't contain people who actually uh, went to some lengths to conceal this retrospective uh, pre-registration. So you might also think that uh, uh, replication might come to the res rescue. Um, replication is the gold standard of scientific research. So we just need to do more replications and uh, then we will see what, are, what studies are trustworthy, which studies are replicable. Uh, however, replications are time consuming and uh, there's no way you can possibly replicate all of the research that you uh, base your research on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, if you, if you rely on other people's replications, so uh, others doing the replications for you, you are uh, still in the same trust uh, uh, trap that you are in for the original studies. What would make you trust the replication studies more than the original studies without uh, indicators of trustworthiness? So uh, instead of relying uh, too heavily on replications, uh, there's a need to create objective indicators for trustworthiness so that we can create uh, trustworthy original studies and trustworthy replications that uh, we can uh, all rely on better. So that was the uh, issue the Transparent C project uh, uh, tried to tackle. And uh, as a case study, we used uh, uh, Daria Bem's uh, 2011 experiment one. Uh, that's what we uh, chose to uh, replicate and uh, create a study where um, the, so, so a, a study, the conclusions of which would be acceptable to uh, the main stakeholders, whatever the outcome uh, of the research might be, whether the research might support uh, the um, C or ESP um, theory or, or the, um, the null hypothesis that there is uh, uh, no indication of ESP. So uh, you are probably all familiar with the uh, BEM 2011 experiment uh, one, but uh, just a, a brief uh, summary. Uh, this was a parapsychological experiment where um, 
people had to uh, or s saw two curtains in front of them on the computer screen uh, and had to guess which of these two curtains hide a picture. Uh, they needed to guess either left or right curtain. Uh, after they guessed, uh, that curtain uh, was, uh, or that curtain disappeared, and it either revealed a picture, which was a, a positive reinforcement that they uh, they did the, uh, or they chose the right curtain, the correct curtain, uh, or a gray background, which indicated that uh, they uh, didn't choose correctly. Uh, so unbeknownst to the participants, the correct side, so the target side, was only randomly decided after they made their choice. Uh, so this makes it a precognition uh, experiment. Uh, if there is a precognition or premonition uh, that uh, tipped off uh, people about which side the, the picture would appear on, uh, then uh, you would expect that there would be higher than chance uh, probability for guessing the correct side. Uh, on the other hand, if there is no precognition, uh, then uh, you would guess or you would expect that people would guess uh, at 50 percent uh, uh, rate so just uh, randomly so uh, our goal was to produce uh, research that would be acceptable and the conclusions would be acceptable for for both sides of the aisle both people who uh, are proponents of the psi theory and those who are skeptical of the psi theory. Uh, the main targets uh, that, that we wanted to tackle this with was to uh, produce a robust research plan that would be secure against post hoc criticism. So it often happens that uh, uh, you produce a, a research study, but the other theoretical aisle would come uh, after the fact, after your the publication, and say that okay, but you didn't do this. You uh, you used uh, different stimuli that we we did. You did a, a bad job at replicating the uh, environment and so on. So we wanted to uh, create a very secure and robust research plan. Uh, and the the other main target was that we wanted to be able to demonstrate the integrity of each research step. So not only claim, but uh, uh, hopefully objectively demonstrate uh, that we did uh, everything as we uh, specified in our plans and uh, in our final paper. So in order to uh, create a robust research plan, the main intervention that we used was uh, an expert consensus design. In this expert consensus design, we systematically invited uh, every researcher who has uh, cited BEM's paper in a research uh, uh, publication and uh, uh, Dario BEM uh, himself, and also uh, others who have contributed uh, significantly to this uh, uh, conversation in the literature. Uh, and we co-designed the research plan with them. There were almost uh, 30 uh, expert uh, uh, researchers in the panel uh, who co-designed this experiment uh, uh, with us. Uh, about half of them uh, proponents of the uh, seed theory and about half of them uh, skeptics. One of the cool features in this consensus design was that we also pre-designed the conclusions of our final paper. So before we collected any data, we have predefined word for the word what would be the final conclusion in this uh, paper for each possible outcome uh, of, of the study. And uh, the uh, panel members uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to fine tune this conclusion. And uh, uh, so we ended up publishing uh, that uh, predefined conclusion uh, that uh, the panelists uh, agreed on. And uh, some of these, uh, the members of this uh, consensus design panel are here today. So, um, of course, we use pre registration and registered reports. And uh, to uh, ensure or be able to demonstrate that uh, the the protocol, the research protocol, was uh, 
de delivered as we intended. We used uh, re experimental manuals and checklists, and uh, we even uh, asked for uh, a, a video recording of uh, a mock research session uh, for from each experimenter to demonstrate that they uh, have completed the training uh, as as we intended. Uh, some of the, the other features I'm, I'm excited about uh, is that we use the direct data deposition, uh, which means that instead of uh, storing the or recording data on paper or on a laptop, we directly pushed our data as it was flowing in uh, to a third party uh, trusted uh, repository, version controlled repository. This way, we are able to demonstrate uh, that the raw data that we collected was uh, uh, unchanged uh, throughout the research process. And uh, uh, we also used born open data. That uh, means that this repository was public from the get-go, so people had access uh, to, this, uh, to, to our data uh, as data were uh, flowing in. Uh, so if uh, there's a tech-savvy or data-savvy person, they could just use this born open data uh, to reproduce our findings and follow our uh, study in real time and how our findings uh, changed. However, uh, most people uh, probably don't have the expertise for that, so we created something that we call the uh, real-time research report. So this real-time research report me meant that uh, through a shiny app, uh, a website, people could uh, uh, see our results uh, analyzed in the way that would be uh, published in the final paper. So uh, as data was flowing in, uh, people could uh, follow uh, live. If we st stop the study now, what would be uh, the uh, finding of the study or what would be our conclusions? We also apply the temper evidence software. So this means that we are able to demonstrate that the experimental program, the software that we used uh, and the experiment itself was unchanged uh, throughout the whole uh, process. So we uh, didn't introduce any bias uh, through this experimental software into our study. Uh, and uh, there were also external research auditors uh, and also an IT auditor who evaluated uh, the integrity of our research or data uh, or procedures. We, we use the holy trinity of uh, open science, open materials, code and uh, data, of course, and our paper is published in open access. So basically with uh, these uh, methodological, this methodological toolkit, we were able to uh, patch up this transparency gap and uh, open up the planning, study execution, data management, data analysis, and uh, uh, the, the results phase uh, of our study much better than uh, with the previous uh, best practices. So let's see briefly what we found with uh, the involvement of 2,115 participants. So this is more than 20 times the number of participants in the original experiment one uh, in the BEMS paper, uh, we found uh, that uh, the probability of successfully guessing the correct side was 49.89%. Uh, uh, that is very close to the 50% uh, expected by chance. And uh, indeed, this data uh, supports the null hypothesis or the null model, indicating that there's uh, no higher than chance uh, probability for guessing uh, correctly in this paradigm. You can also see the uh, base factor uh, accumulation of the base factor over time. Uh, it remains uh, above 50 um, throughout most of the uh, data collection process, indicating a strong support for the neural model again. So uh, we can conclude that the findings of this study uh, are not consistent with the predictions of the uh, ESP model in, in this uh, paradigm, and that the failure to reproduce the previous positive findings with this strict methodology uh, indicates that the overall positive effect in the literature might be uh, the result of recognized methodological biases rather than extrasensory perception, or C. However, uh, the, we cannot rule out, of course, uh, the existence of C or ESP uh, with uh, 
uh, this uh, study alone. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we can uh, say with uh, quite uh, big confidence that this particular paradigm that was used in uh, experiment one of them is very unlikely to yield evidence for uh, the existence of C or ESP or precognition. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the gracious funding uh, from the Bial Foundation uh, for this research project and the uh, donated time uh, of the consensus uh, panel members. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, mentioned, but uh, Daryl Bem was also uh, in the in the, this consensus design uh, panel, and uh, of course the, our co-authors and. Uh, um, the collaborating lab uh, members uh, who participated in this uh, big uh, multi-site research project. Uh, you can find uh, our paper of the, with the results and uh, about this study in Royal Society Open Science. So uh, with this brief uh, introduction uh, to the project, I would like to um, again thank uh, all of you who have uh, um, joined uh, this uh, uh, event and uh, the panelists who, who are giving their time uh, and uh, let's have a good discussion about uh, this project. So uh, before the conference, we had uh, um, an email uh, discussion and uh, based on that email discussion, uh, we ha have formulated a few questions that uh, might be worthwhile to uh, discussing here. Uh, one of the first uh, questions that uh, I'm personally very interested in uh, is uh, related to uh, whether you, uh, what, what do you think about the conclusions of uh, the paper? So as I indicated, uh, these conclusions that you can read in the paper have been uh, pre-formulated in this consensus design process and we didn't uh, uh, change uh, them after the uh, data collection. So uh, one of the indicators of, of success of this consensus design process uh, to me uh, would be uh, if people uh, say that they still agree with this um, uh, co conclusion. So what do you uh, all think about uh, the conclusion of the paper? Patricio. <coughs> There is out that uh, this um, experimental uh, design or TPP is a, a serious candidate for being uh, a golden standard for the, a new generation of uh, register or register report. Um, I'm curious about the opinion of the methodologists present in the panel, but. <coughs> This is the, uh, first a unique example of uh, an uh, implement uh, of the uh, uh, present um, standard of registered record. There is no doubt. Uh, and consequently, the results obtain uh, tell a clear story. With this paradigm, uh, this experiment design, there is no sign of uh, recognition or uh, anticipation of future um, unpredictable events. This is clear. Of course, is uh, if we uh, reflect about a result, uh, some skeptical may uh, think, okay, this is another demonstration that uh, PSI uh, is a, a, an a absurd hypothesis, uh, but uh, if we uh, know all the literature about this line of investigation, uh, the only possible conclusion is uh, that uh, this particular experiment design didn't show any I remember that this one of many uh, different uh, protocols that can be uh, used to test such uh, weird hypotheses that I like must. <laughs> and in, in the literature, unfortunately, most of the participants don't know the, 
all the third. So I can only summarize that uh, uh, using a recruiting um, non-selected participant and asking them to perform a forced choice uh, task <laughs> in a normal state of consciousness. There is a demonstration even from the supporter <laughs> of the longer of the way the hypothesis uh, usually show the less uh, reliable result of sometime there are positive results, <coughs> but with very tiny, tiny effort size. So, <coughs> and uh, I recommend all who are, uh, say, satisfied by the findings of the P, <coughs> non uh, apply the constraints of generalizability, sorry for my pronunciation, <laughs> that is recommended in all uh, experimental design. So <clears throat> to end the story, uh, the are correct. There is no sign of recognition, anticipation, etc. with particular <clears throat> experimental design, but uh, I recommend not to extend the general <laughs> this finding to all field. This is a, a, not only a theoretical, but an empirical question. If we find other null results applying different experiment design. Thank you, Patricio. Marcel? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Zoltan. Um, I agree with the conclusions. I think it is a really excellent study. The methodology is uh, superb. Many uh, innovations in research, I would say, and I'm very much in favor of the consensus design that has been applied. And uh, I agree with the conclusion that there is no evidence of ESP in this particular framework. But I, from a, a meta science perspective, I'm very much interested in how this affects as scientists, uh, which is our profession, our belief in whether ESP exists or not. Because when we do research, as a researcher, this the outcomes of the research will have to affect our beliefs. And that, that's what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, how about you, EJ? Uh, well, so I think it's an interesting um, high quality methodological demonstration for outsiders. But when it's about, does it change our beliefs? I don't think proponents would greatly change their mind. And I think had the results come out differently, so let's say the effect would have been 55%, right? We probably uh, had agreed to say something like, this is strong evidence that something's going on, right? I would totally not have subscribed to that conclusion. Right, I would have said, okay, what is more miraculous, right, that uh, Zoltan actually is completely fraudulent and fakes these data, or that there's this effect that violates the known laws of nature? Well, you know, sorry, Zoltan, but I would have bet it against you. So I, it would not have changed my mind greatly had the re results come out uh, differently. I have to say. So I think it's a very interesting project, but mostly because it kind of demonstrates, like. If I'm not sure every project needs to go through through this length, right, of doing it, but you know, it's a. I think it's a it's a it's a great um, methodological demonstration in terms of changing beliefs. I'm not sure. I've I've encountered very very few researchers who've ever changed their minds about anything, but um, um, yeah. So I don't. I I, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, some of the proponents or advocates have something to uh, to say about that as well. Okay, so Jacob, um, I think you were next. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Zoltan, for your pretty nice introduction. And, and again, my congratulations on this project. I think it's a brilliant demonstration of, of how to do things right, in particular in a controversial topic like this one. Um, interestingly, in terms of changing beliefs and thinking how you uh, think about science and example, the ESP hypothesis. For me, this study, uh, it did change my mind. I was open to the possibility of the existence of, of ESP. I think that 
the ESP hypothesis in this particular uh, experiment, it, it's quite difficult to maintain a, a belief in, in the existence of ESP as something that exists as a signal, as something that can be used as a way to gather information about the environment intentionally. Uh, so in that sense, it did change my mind uh, a bit about the ESP hypothesis. I think it's difficult to maintain that, that ESP exists as something that we can measure and capture in an experimental setting. Um, that said, as you probably know, there are many more ideas about what might cause all these weird effects in the research that go beyond project research practices. So in that sense, uh, side research in general or my research is still very much quite kicking and worthwhile. Uh, but the ESP hypothesis, so the idea that you can actually measure people intentionally uh, obtaining information from their environment via ways that we do not know about yet, I think it's very, very unlikely given this set of particular measures. So it did change my mind in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, no, was it you? The <coughs> yeah, I think it was me. Yes. Um, uh, my opinion is uh, like partly so that the, the TPP is an upgrade of scientific practice with all the best uh, controversy killers tools. Uh, this allows to test some hypothesis about side phenomena response to such experimental condition. But this research is still imperfect. You have made, um, you have hired Jim Kennedy as a parapsychologist and specialist of medical research for an external research audit. And he listed good and bad points and show an asymmetry. The consistency, bit, I quote him, uh, the consistency between the pre registration and the published report was very good, except that discussing protocol deviation was adequate. Key aspect of the management of the data collection so server and software were rated as not adequate and when combined represent serious deficiency. It is the summary of his report. And he said, and this is the asymmetry, if the study would have found evidence for ESP, concerns about the protocol deviation and inadequate computer system management would have been much greater. So this is some part of the aspect of the discussion too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, uh, we can get back to uh, to these points, uh, and I'm making um, notes furiously. Uh, but uh, let's uh, uh, continue with David. Good morning. Um, okay, so I think it's worth just trying to address that that issue of would it change my mind? And that's a I feel like a typical psychologist because I'm going to say yes and no. Um, in the sense that, yes, it changes my mind about this particular paradigm, this protocol, if you like, uh, measure, you know, experiment one from BEM's suite of experiments. This tells me in a very sort of methodologically robust way, uh, you know, and there's a lot of things, that are, a lot of steps that you've gone through here. And I think it's um, somebody said it's the gold standard. Patricio, I think you said it, this could be the gold standard methodological research uh, it just struck me that perhaps it's even the platinum standard it's just like it's above and beyond the expectations there but it does change my mind in the sense of you know i would look or i, I would now think to myself you know i don't think there's really much mileage in trying to rerun that type of paradigm in an effort to try and find a whatever you want to call it retroactive priming effect, you know, precognitive effect, however we want to frame those words. Um, so I think that's a really nice notion that it may be, and it might be that that's where, um, like, the, or that's one potential benefit or use of this, because it is very methodologically intense. And what, you know, I've spoken to you about this Zoltan already, but, you know, one of the things that's, that concerns me a little is, is, is that, you know, this is quite costly as well. The whole thing is, is, is very, very um, uh, intense and costly. And that limits it, that, that, that introduces a whole range of restrictions. And sci research generally is, you know, as all research, I'm sure every researcher is, is completely aware of how difficult it is to get funds uh, to support their research. Um, and this would be even more challenging if, if every type, every piece of sci research had to go through this. But so in terms of changing my mind, yes, I think this tells me that that paradigm isn't, 
there's probably not much there. Does it change my mind in the sense of, you know, do I now think Sai, whatever that may be, is nonsense? Not really. I think it's a point on the graph. Um, you know, hopefully what we could do is accrue more information. And that might be one way forward. We take the more, I don't know, the areas where Sai is proposed to be robust i can think of things like gansfeld etc and and then maybe run them through this procedure so it's not that we use this on everything but we try to take the best examples whatever they may be of sci and use this sort of extremely rigorous methodological approach to see if we can then elicit those effects that might be one way forward Thank you all. Um, so I think this is a nice segue to uh, talking about cost and benefit uh, of the different uh, methods. So um, Sam Schwarzkopf unfortunately couldn't make it uh, to this uh, panel discussion, but uh, in our pre-conference uh, uh, discussion, uh, he sent uh, an interesting point about this. So I would like to quote uh, him uh, here uh, to start the next uh, round of, of uh, questions. So uh, he is saying, uh, we can pat each other uh, on the back about uh, our greatness all we, we like. Uh, this doesn't address the elephant in the room. Uh, does anyone here actually think it is feasible to do a study like this regularly? I doubt it, but even if that uh, were the case, it would be unwise and uh, irresponsible. As I said above, there are many more worthwhile hypotheses that could result in so, uh, societal benefit or even just considerable advance on understanding the brain and the mind. Running this study like the TPP on every important question would be utterly wasteful and slow down science to a, gracious, uh, to a glacial pace. I do agree that uh, slow science uh, has its value. And in general, uh, we should slow things down a bit, uh, counteracting the incentives of uh, for publish and perish, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think running TPP uh, on everything is the answer either. Uh, research needs to find a good co compromise, a good trade-off between methodological rigor without making, making progress grind down to a halt. Uh, to me, the answer to these challenges is not running super large scale studies with data being uploaded centrally, but to improve transparency, regularly uh, check reproducibility of uh, uploaded data and uh, publishing results, uh, facilitate independent replication. Of course, occasionally uh, studies like the TPP can and should be done, uh, but uh, I would expect them to be rare. So, um, what do you think uh, about this, the uh, cost benefit uh, of the methodological toolkit that uh, we developed here and uh, whether this should be, or which of these methods should be applied uh, in uh, mainstream research? I think Patricio was first and... I think uh, in the way, I think that uh, the two main uh, improvement uh, of TPP that uh, I suggested in the uh, previous email exchanges can be renamed in, as transparent pre-registration protocols. <laughs> uh, in color, the uh, both open data and uh, even more the uh, app uh, application of the pre-registered statistical analysis of the ongoing data <laughs> Respecting all the pre uh, uh, declared in the pre in the pre registration is uh, something that can be <laughs> used in every uh, uh, registered report. Uh, uh, in up the, the gap that you mentioned in the introduction, because even in the registered reports, they are the uh, say the the, uh, the in my view some of the best uh, control of the uh, of the intention of the investigators. There are voluntarily or involuntary say always deviations from pre-registered uh, declaration, in particular about. Uh, um, 
processing data and uh, uh, some degrees of freedom in the option of the statistical analysis. If we uh, include these two in, uh, uh, innovations in all pre-registered reports, I think this will be a great uh, leap, a great jump in the quality of uh, uh, experimental uh, uh, experiment, in all experiment, uh, not only in psychology, but in many other disciplines. Thank you, Patricio. So, Jacob. Yeah, thanks. So, one of the interesting things about the TPP and the methodology that it uses is yes, it's very costly. It is very uh, labor intensive. So, in that sense, I completely agree with, with, with Sam's point that this might not be the way forward for every single psychological experiment. On the other hand, uh, just yesterday was the presentation of new Dutch projects for research infrastructure, and one of them quite struck me was a very big project about uh, research and ecology uh, and basically it was a centralized data store with real-time data upload born open data a very nice dashboard to do your own analysis and research so in that sense the methodological, methodological invention that we see in the tpp also find ways into other research areas so I, I really do think that we are at a, at a point in time where, where innovation, including research, is something that can be radically transformed because we have new ways to gather data, to share data, uh, and, and to do all that in, in a increasingly effective way. So the nice thing about this ecology project was that it was actually open for anyone. So uh, if you have a camera in your own backyard, you sit in the sun, you can just Plug it in. It's looking brilliant. Um, so, in that sense, uh, uh, I do think that reforms that we see here with the TPP will find their way in more mainstream research. On the other hand, it's also important that we keep in the back of our minds that uh, a part of the problem that we're trying to address here is not just methodological, it has to do with trust in science, it has to do with trust in hypotheses. It also has to do with the quality of theorizing. So in the end, the TPP was aimed at the case with one single experiment where we believe that there will be a difference between two conditions. We don't know what's causing the difference. We don't, don't have any kind of predictions about the, the, the size of this uh, particular effect. Uh, we don't understand in which specific consequences the effect occurs, if at all. So in that sense, uh, uh, what we uh, have been trying to do in, in ESP research, and I've, I've done quite a few of these experiments myself, um, is that we're trying to find something, a difference. And as we all know, every single panelist here knows finding a difference in the data set, um, well, it's very easy to fool yourself. Uh, so in that sense, I think that another thing that we should work on as a not just as a psych community, as a psychology community in general, is to work on the quality of our hypothesis, that we should go beyond uh, a hypothesis that says we expect a difference between group A and B, because finding a difference is actually too easy. We should be a bit more specific with our hypotheses. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd like to add, two things. We are working on the infrastructure already. We would also need to work on hypothesizing rather than just methodological innovation. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Marcel, please go on. I need to get uh, a charger. I will be back in. Um... Yes, so I think this project had many methodological innovations that make this research and its outcomes very trustworthy. But on the other hand, I think, um, yeah, you need to be a methods expert to be able to do all this. And to not exclude all these scientists do, who cannot do this yet, uh, I would not be in favor of having many such projects or, or uh, wanting scientists to do these projects. However, um, what I believe is important in research, and I think we should do it more, are three steps. One, the consensus design approach, use it more often. I do not see it a lot yet. It would be great that before starting your research, you ask particularly people 
who are not believing in the theory to go work on the design. So we could use that more often, use pre-registration more often. Um, this is now happening more in psychology, but um, unfortunately, most people who pre-register their research do not do it well yet. And so there's a lot of things uh, to do there. And what I mean, good pre-registration is that uh, in advance, you also pre-register the code for the main analysis of the hypothesis you want to test. And I would also love to have open data, open code, and open um, research materials. And with these three pillars, I think we would do a great job in, uh, in empirical research. Thank you, Marcel. So, David? Yes, um, I think I would echo that. Really, um, there's a lot. There are a lot of steps here in this in this piece of work, um, and th I mean they're all very very good. Uh, but I think it would be laborious to the extent, you know, to the extreme to to expect every sci research project to to go through this. But that doesn't mean that we can't incorporate some of them, and some of them might be a lot easier to. To incorporate than others things like you know the direct data deposition born open data i think those might be a little bit easier to set up and even things like the lab logs and all that you know records from those things aren't so onerous really and i think you know could be sort of expected much more up front i think so there are certain aspects of this that i think would be easier to implement than others um and i don't see why why that would be a problem and i could imagine a situation as we move forward where funding councils would expect this of all research that they fund. Um, and certainly um, in some of the projects that I've been involved in and some of the research funding issues that I've been associated with, it's becoming much more the norm for funding councils to expect things like, you know, pre-registration, open access publishing and things, you know, so data deposition would be, you know, a natural step forward. I think all of these things. So, you know, I think it, I see this much more as a gradual process. I think there's you've set a sort of very high bar with a, a, a range of um, methodological um, issues that we can that, that we can adopt uh, approaches that we can adopt and it now, won't always be possible to to adopt every single one of them. But over time, we can, you know, we can take them on one by one, as it were. So I think this, I see this as very a sort of a stepped approach. Thank you, David and uh, EJ. Well, it reminds me a little bit of this project I was involved in uh, testing uh, the facial feedback uh, hypothesis. And in particular, the idea that if you hold a pen between your teeth, uh, your face, face is in the smile position and you rate cartoons, cartoons as being more funny. So, so we did this as part of a registered replication report. Uh, I think that at the time that was for uh, perspectives on psychological science. And we, in the end, it involved 17 different labs and we had an, uh, sort of a proponent of the effect who vetted the protocol. And, uh, and I have to say, this was one of the most intense research experiences that I've been involved in. Like it took forever and it, it was, I had to hire a, an assistant specifically for this project who did most of the work, but it was still, it was still uh, quite an effort. And that was only on our part. Then there were these 17 other labs that had to videotape the participants to make sure that they were holding the pen correctly and do ratings afterwards. And it was, it was quite something. So, uh, and this, this project, went beyond what we were doing at the time. So I can only uh, uh, congratulate everybody who worked on this uh, project because I know how, how time intense, uh, intensive this is. And I, I, I do think that if people want to apply this procedure, they have to very, well, maybe another good thing about it is if you want to use this particular procedure, it forces you to think very carefully about your hypotheses beforehand and select hypotheses that you think are really important. Because if it's something that you don't think is really important, you're not going to go through all this uh, uh, trouble. Um, and I also think in general, uh, this is something we haven't really discussed, but um, there's a, 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 it's, it's a little counterintuitive that replication research can be uh, so exciting. Um, so uh, 
I remember when I uh, had a student who came in for looking for a research project and I proposed some replication and she was very disappointed because she thought it was extremely boring, but it became immediately clear that as soon as she contacted the original researcher, uh, that it was actually really exciting because uh, people immediately get a little edgy when you tell them that you're going to replicate their work. And then, of course, there's the, uh, uh, you know, what will happen? Uh, will the effect replicate or will it not replicate? So I think, uh, I think it's, it's, there, there's more sort of prestige associated, re, re, research, prestige for researchers associated with doing replication research. But I mean, what are the current rates of people actually doing replication research? It's still very low, I think. So, um, so I think uh, that is something that I would like to see changed as well. Thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, so before we go on with some pre-formulated questions, I think it would be great to uh, open up uh, here for audience questions now, because there was, uh, uh, I think, some confusion about how long this webinar would, would last. We will go uh, for 90 minutes, uh, but uh, still some people might have expected one hour. So uh, let's see what the audience has to ask us. Tom, Tom could you uh, relay some questions from the Q&A? Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, there's one from Chris Rowe. I don't know if he wants to, they want to ask that question themselves. Um, but in the meantime, uh, there's one from Jason Chin, which I think, I think it was very really early on in your uh, presentation, Zoltan. He says, isn't retrospective registration a far cry from saying data fabrication is widespread? Yes. Uh, I mean, saying that uh, or pretending that your you had the research plan and uh, the hypotheses uh, before you you collected data, while actually uh, you only formulated this uh, registration afterwards, I think it's uh, it's very similar to fabrication. So uh, I can I can very easily see a researcher uh, imagine it in my mind that uh, this person uh, had like uh, uh, okay a million dollar grant and uh, the p value is 0.06. Uh, and uh, he would just uh, think that, oh, I, I just need this this tiny push, you know. Uh, I, I know that the effect exists. Everybody knows that. It just, uh, for, for some dumb reason, uh, the, one of the participants was drunk when the, they came in. I would just nudge the results, you know. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, uh, similar uh, fraud. Uh, and and uh, people just uh, rationalize it uh, in a way that it seems um, like uh, less intense. But I think it, it is very similar. And okay. we, we don't have a, a clear uh, marker of uh, how often uh, actual data fabrication is going on. Uh, and uh, this this at least has uh, some clear records that we can rely on. So uh, it could be uh, a, a proxy for, for a sort of uh, fabrication, yes. Okay. Um, Chris, would you like to ask your question? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, yeah. Great, yeah, so I'll, I'll essentially just read what I've written. Um, thank you for the presentation. This is certainly a gold standard design with respect to precautions against QRPs what I've called the meta experiment. But from my perspective in reading the paper, this has been at the expense of paying due attention to the experiment itself. Uh, Patricio, I think, mentioned something along these lines earlier. Very little consideration is given in the paper to the participants and their participatory experience. Uh, for example, the recruitment of participants is described cursorily, um, some through course credit, some by other means, and, and that's not really a consideration. And it's not obvious from the paper, you mentioned this last night at another talk, that 60% of participants actually completed their trial in a group setting, which is a very different psychological experience. Uh, there's some reflection in the paper on the general antipathy to Psy of the collaborating researchers, but that too seems to reflect a general lack of interest in how that might translate into participant expectations that could affect an outcome. 
Now, this isn't something magical that applies only to parapsychology, though parapsychologists have considered it in a bit more detail. Psychology generally is actually replete with psychosocial experimental effects. Bob Rosenthal, many people will know, did much work in that area. But sadly, that kind of approach in the paper um, tends to reinforce the public's perception that psychologists see participants as unidimensional data generators rather than reflective human beings who respond to the circumstances that they find themselves in. So it's more of a statement, but I'd be very interested in your reflections on that as a statement. Okay, so is there anyone uh, who'd like to uh, respond to that? Yes, Jacob? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I really think it's a very interesting and worthwhile statement. Also, in, in uh, kind of, a, I'd like to take together with the next question by my uh, who basically asks, well, what of these PSP phenomena only occur in more naturalistic settings? So basically, and this, this is a kind of um, alternative view to, to psi phenomena. Uh, interestingly, there are some alternative ideas towards this ESP hypothesis. So the ESP hypothesis is that, that we can actually use uh, anomalous sources of information to inform ourselves. Whereas there are alternative takes to psi, basically, see psi as uh, either a probabilistic phenomena, where things that occur very often in relation to, uh, well, some alternative models to, to mind-brain relationship. So, for example, advanced psychist theories um, rather explicitly uh, predict psi phenomena to occur, but only uh, and only if the, the setting is right. Ironically, the setting being right means in a rather uh, unrestricted uh, setting. So basically what we're doing as psychologists is that we're trying to isolate a particular phenomenon from basically nature and, and, and the environment in which it occurs to really pinpoint and try to study that particular thing. That's what experiments are basically for, trying to, to reduce all kinds of environmental factors and only focus on the one thing that you're interested in. It works in many, many different uh, situations, many different kinds of phenomena, but there are some theorists, and I, I think with reason, uh, that saying that in particular for these kinds of uh, phenomena, um, basically reducing your setting, reducing the degrees of freedom in which uh, uh, these kinds of effects can express themselves to, to just the press of a button, uh, it, it might not work. And it, Ties in to, to Eric's question, so, well, does it pop up if you don't watch him? Well, very conveniently, it might be the case. Uh, but also to Chris's question with regard to the role of the participant. So if you indeed reduce the role of the participant to, to a button pressing machine, it might indeed not be conducive to a lot of the phenomenal richdom that entails human experience. So in that sense, I. I uh, this resonates with me. Unfortunately, it, it also makes it a bit more difficult to talk about the issues in a more empirical setting because if you have to pay attention to the phenomenology as well, it kind of clashes with the uh, rather quantitative way that we think about psychology in sort of mainstream psychology. And um, having said that, I, I would have loved to stay on a bit longer, but I see that my colleagues are waiting for me for my next medicine. So again, my congratulations to all of you. I really like this discussion. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, Zoltan, again, my congratulations. Brilliant project. Uh, really great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob, for your participation. Uh, so, um, and thank you for answering this question. Marcel, uh, do you have anything to add? You're muted. Yes, thank you. And so when I was involved in this, uh, this project in the panel, I thought about the ESP phenomenon and I thought, well, I believe it's unlikely it exists, but maybe, uh, and particularly that we all have it, but perhaps there are a few people who may have it. I like, uh, I don't mean it sarcastically, a Jesus type persons who do have the ability. And therefore, I, I really insisted on looking at the extreme performance also and do statistics on that. 
And um, also when looking at the best performing persons in this environment, they didn't perform better than chance. So if you would argue something against the particular setup, then we'd like to add that in this particular setup, maybe some people may be disadvantaged, but it would then be quite unlikely that all of them are uh, not uh, yeah are at a disadvantage. So I'm following following up on this. I think this research um, is best served by uh, looking for people who may have ESP and doing strict tests on that or them. Right? It's, it's cheaper also. Um, and if indeed we find that there are such people, uh, we do not. Yeah, there is no strong evidence yet that that there are such people. Then we have something, and we can continue doing research uh, based on that. But this general population uh, research, I think, may not be worthwhile because um, given these types of research, it's, it's rather implausible, I believe, that we all have this ESP phenomenon. Yes, thank you, Marcel. Uh, one thing I would like to add to the question uh, by Chris is that uh, the experimental manual and also the checklist indicated or uh, contained uh, some uh, instructions on how to uh, keep the the atmosphere that was uh, um, included in the in the original BAM paper and uh, and also in the uh, training uh, videos we were looking for for these um, aspects so we were not completely uh, like disregarding this aspect, we we put uh, some effort uh, into into keeping the the same uh, kind of uh, uh, environment and and also the uh, feel of the experiment as in the original BAM study. That being said, we cannot objectively demonstrate that uh, each time we were able to keep this up. We didn't ask participants about the feelings uh, during the experiment and so on. So there might be, uh, it might be that we failed uh, in this. We, we cannot demonstrate uh, this. Okay, uh, David, uh, do you have Yeah, anything? I was just gonna, in a sense, um, e echo that point that you've just made. I mean, you know, trying to um, sort of speak to Chris's question, or, or issue, which is this the the this this idea of um, how we treat the participants, um, how we interact with them, how we recruit them, all of those things. You know, I do I do think this is an issue that we deal with in psychology, not just in 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 what do we call this parapsychology generally. I think we deal with this really quite poorly. In a report is a fairly straightforward sort of quantitative you know this is how many we got and this is you know their age and we talk about that we, we don't often report about the interactions between the experimenter and the participant and you know and those things um, and yet we know from psychological research those things can have an effect i mean i've in other areas that i've worked at trying to um, measure things like creativity in the lab is always a challenging aspect and how you interact with the participants can have a big impact on that. And, and you know, I think it's just something to keep in mind. Um, it's one of those, what is it, Rumsfeld things. It's like, there are many more unknowns here, but I do think, um, and it, I guess in a sense, it, I feel a bit like a lawyer in the sense that, that I'm just being very specific when I look at this paper and think, okay, it tells me that it didn't work using this particular paradigm. And it's and that paradigm has to include things like and that's how we recruited participants and that's how we ran them and that's every aspect of it. And if we change any aspect of that, that may well change the outcome because these things can have an effect. Okay, so um, I see that there's someone with raised hand in the participants, but uh, Tom, could you? Um, give us a hint of how uh, we should progress in terms of order of questions. Yeah. Uh, see if uh, is it how? Uh, so if I pronounce that incorrectly, if you want to ask your question or make your comment. Um, yeah. 
No. Um, other than that, we don't have any more questions. So I think maybe uh, if you carry on and then uh, mm -hmm. maybe I can read this out in a, in a few minutes. Yes, okay. So uh, until is it how uh, comes back, uh, we could uh, address some of the other questions. So another thing that I would be um, interested in uh, what do you all think about uh, the role of automation in, in research, increasing credibility in research? And uh, uh, specifically, it is uh, getting more and more uh, current with uh, the uh, new uh, progresses in, in AI technology. Uh, so there, there has been some research studies that have been autonomously carried out by just AI now. Uh, and... Uh, this uh, is within arm's reach in, in our field of science as well. Uh, so what do you uh, think uh, employing uh, AI and automating or handing over uh, most or all of the research steps to, uh, to AI agents uh, would increase uh, uh, the credibility of our, of our research project? Uh, and what do you think about the usefulness of these uh, uh, research uh, in general? Yes, yes, Marcel. Yeah, so last uh, 10 years, uh, I've been doing research on meta science. And the more I get uh, uh, yeah, a bad feeling about humans as researchers, humans have many biases. Uh, confirmation bias is uh, one of the most prominent. Uh, for instance, a good example is that researchers often uh, look for phenomena that confirm their suspicions while following Popper, we should look for um, events that uh, may falsify our beliefs. But we, we humans simply don't do that. Researchers are humans and uh, it's too difficult for us. So in that respect, I think um, we could be helped a lot by machines and by simple or simple, by strict logical machines um, who may assist us? Okay, so um, I see that. Uh, so just uh, following up on on this, um, the. So what you said, Marcel, that uh, uh, people have these uh, uh, confirmation biases, uh, unfortunately, as uh, we train our uh, AI systems on human data, we might uh, inadvertently impart uh, these, these biases to, to the AI. So just like uh, uh, racism uh, is involved in the AI systems that uh, uh, are used in the US for parole, uh, uh, decisions, we might be uh, uh, imparting some of these <laughs> these researcher biases. So I would be interested in in the psychology of AI uh, related to these confirmation biases. That would be interesting. Okay, so uh, if there's no more discussion uh, about this, top oh, David. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to go so far as to say that um, that AI should replace researchers. I mean, I, I love my job and I have a lot of fun doing it and I want to carry on doing it. But I mean, they could play a role. I mean, in a sense, one would hope that the that as scientists, we come together in that sort of spirit of collaboration where both proponents and skeptics, you know, will work together. And perhaps that's where that's where maybe the open um, collaboration ideas will, will, um, will flourish. But, you know, I could see a role for AI sort of um not 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 but making you re rethink or at least keep it you know making you think about alternative possibilities and ideas uh, but not so sort of working with it rather than being replaced by it that's that's what i think because as you say um the way we we wouldn't be uh, privy to how that ai has been programmed or what learning algorithms it uses um, one of these things that comes to mind is i remember reading recently about 
AI program that was that was used to identify cancer tumors and literally identified them using a, a ruler because in the slide that always had a tumor always a ruler to show how big the tumor was and of course you know, rulers don't produce, you know, don't lead to cancer at all you know so it's, it's how the ais learn this you know so we need to be very careful not just falling into a, a false assumption of thinking somehow the ai is going to be completely unbiased um, and you know, rightly so of course humans are biased we're all biased and you know the fact that we recognize that and we try to keep ourselves in check and um and allow our colleagues from both sides of the aisle to to check on us as well i think is a good thing so i, I would see them as perhaps working in collaboration i think it would be a fun thing to have uh, an ai as a, a collaborative author on your paper <laughs> okay thank you thank you david uh, so uh, I saw that uh, uh, Isato asked us to read the, his or her question in. Uh, could you help us, Tom? Maybe uh, they posted it uh, in the Q&A. Yeah, uh, so I will, uh, I'll read this out. Uh, the increasing role of meta-science in science holds great promise and some risk. Already, its influence can be seen in the growing proportion of studies that are pre-registered, as well as many journals' adoption of badges for pre-registration and the sharing of data and materials. In addition, many scientists now understand that the previously common practice of combing through a new data set to find a good story and then reframing the results to tell that story can potentially lead to erroneous conclusions. The growing salience of meta-science in the field is in many respects like holding a mirror up to science and the scientists who conduct it. On the one hand, exposure to a mirror is known to enhance conscientiousness, and indeed it seems likely that the emergence of meta-science concerns may be encouraging scientists to be more disciplined in a way that they conduct their research. However, mirrors can also make people self-conscious, and it seems plausible that scrutiny, scrutiny of the scientific process could at least sometimes stifle scientific creativity and risk-taking. Okay, so uh, there was uh, a lot in there, but I guess the question, the, the main question is, uh, what do you see any risks of uh, increasing uh, scrutiny and uh, uh, pushing down hard on this uh, credibility uh, point uh, in relation to science? And uh, for example, increasing uh, like uh, things that could be described as surveillance, um, could, could that uh, stifle research creativity? So, so what do you think uh, about this question? Yes, Marcel? Yes, uh, sorry for talking again. Um, <laughs> we are here for that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand the sentiment, but um, I don't agree. And so pre-registration in itself doesn't stifle creativity um, because you don't have to pre-register all the research. You could also do all the research and tell this honestly to uh, people. And even when you pre-register your research, you're also free to analyze your data in other ways as long as you report how you did this. So in principle, the creativity is just the same as before, but uh, you also have a part that you devote to clear, rigorous, pre-registered um, hypothesis testing, huh? whether you do this with traditional um, statistics or with base, uh, pick your thing. Uh, so that, that would be uh, my answer. So I understand the sentiment, um, but um, you can still do your research however you like, report it honestly, and uh, you do a great job. Although I like it when you do more pre-registration, by the way. Yes, anybody else wants to chime in? I, I completely agree uh, that... Uh, Pre, for things like pre-registration needs to be used uh, the right way. And uh, for example, in uh, uh, medical research, uh, there's uh, 
better understanding, I think, of the staged build-up of a research uh, project. Uh, like uh, you start with uh, case studies or uh, some show of promise, then you, you do a feasibility study, a pilot study. And only in the very end you would get to the, uh, like the big RCT uh, stage where, where uh, pre-registration is something that uh, is crucial. So uh, I think in psychological science, due to the pre pressures uh, that are involved in the publication process, uh, people usually just simply skip the, the first stages and the, everyone wants to do a confirmatory study uh, immediately, or they rather want to do an exploratory study, but may want to make it seem like a confirmatory study in the end. Um, so uh, I think uh, the slow science thing uh, here uh, could be definitely applied to psychological science in the sense that uh, we should uh, do the prep work uh, for, for our studies uh, better. And uh, pre-registration could be applied in these pre-steps as well, if you want, but they are not so crucial as for the uh, confirmatory stage. You just need to be clear of what stage this study is in right now. Okay. Um, uh, I see that one new question appeared uh, in the q and Is that so, Tom, or I'm not sure I'm reading it correctly. Uh, I think these are, slightly more on the top of a topic of AI. So um, I think if you've got additional questions for the panel and we haven't got much time left, maybe you should move to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, one of the things that uh, came up as well was that uh, the TPP did a good job in um, addressing this transparency gap, uh, but we didn't really uh, deal with the part of recruitment. So we cannot demonstrate, uh, for example, that uh, uh, it was actually all unique humans who, who did the research and not a single person at each lab who did the experiment a uh, number of times. Uh, there are some indications in the born open data. So the data was coming in uh, at the same time uh, so it would have been very hard for a single human to use uh, uh, those keyboards, but still they could have set up uh, like uh, a computer system or something to produce the, these data. So uh, do you think that uh, we should extend uh, the transparency to the uh, recruitment stage to be able to demonstrate that uh, or the, P the data is coming from real people and the real unique people, or is this something that's um, like, doesn't really matter uh, and we, we shouldn't focus on this. In, in the particular, in the Transparent C project, this was not really a concern because it would have been just as uh, impressive if a computer or a single human is able to do the precognition uh, as, uh, as if it's uh, 2000 uh, humans but uh, I'm talking about more psychological science in, in generally. What do you think? Marcel, do you still have your hand up, but I'm not sure. I think you left it up. Okay, so it seems that there's no substantive discussion uh, of that. I personally think it's uh, it would be great if we could uh, uh, have an, an easy way to demonstrate uh, uh, this, but uh, this would require some uh, human detector. And I, I think that there will be a lot of uh, progress in this in other areas, not in, in psychological science or science, but uh, in general, because of the uh, AI Im Im improvements, we will uh, see soon some uh, unique human detectors that uh, we 
we will apply to, to distinguish between, between AI-generated content and, and human-generated content. And we just need to wait a little bit and apply these techniques in, in psychological science. Uh, okay, so um, one uh, other thing, during this discussion, uh, it came up that, uh, for example, uh, EJ, you said that you would have betted uh, against uh, the conclusion if uh, we found a uh, higher than chance uh, uh, guess rate. And uh, you said you, you wouldn't have sur subscribed to, to these uh, conclusions. So the conclusions would have been something like uh, there's a strong evidence uh, uh, supporting that there's a correlation between uh, human guesses and uh, computer generated uh, random numbers. So it wouldn't have been the conclusion wouldn't have been precognition exists rather that there's a, a correlation there. And I think that simply correlation uh, does not violate uh, physics. So it doesn't imply retrocausation. Uh, but but now then you have to come up with an explanation. Right, and I think I cannot. Well, if you can think of an explanation that doesn't violate the laws of physics, that I'm, uh, then that would be really great. But you know, I'm reminded of this um, of this phenomenon where at some point they found, I think it was in Italy, uh, evidence that neutrinos could go faster than the speed of light, and uh, I. Uh, the head of a physics department in the U.S. summarized it by saying, uh, this is like uh, the equivalent of finding a flying carpet. And so sure enough, uh, you know, it was a material malfunction um, that explained the measurements. So I would, I would go that route if I would see this. I would, I would think like we have a flying carpet here. I don't believe in flying carpets. Um, Yes. So, so obviously, you know, it, 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 um, I wouldn't be a Bayesian if I didn't assign probability epsilon to psi being real, but epsilon is really small for me. So I would need to see evidence for it in many different ways for me to really change my mind. So I'm just a, yeah, yeah. And I would say, <clears throat> before I forget to bring this up, I did think it was really cool to do the Bayesian hypothesis testing to carefully think about a prior distribution, monitor the evidence over time, and also, you know, uh, that you're able to quantify evidence in favor of the absence of an effect is also really cool. So I thought the, the like, I'm of course a big fan of Bayesian hypothesis test in general, but especially in situations like these, where I think, you know, uh, when you put so much effort into the data collection and safeguarding everything, uh, I sometimes see that people then just unthinkingly uh, use some kind of approach because everybody uses it or you know something like that. And I, I re really think it, that's a missed opportunity. And in general, uh, I think uh, more attention should go to methodologists for these for these projects, right? Because you only need one or two. Uh, to 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 work on this, and it can lift the 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 level of the of the entire project. Um, yeah, it can it can lift to a whole new level. So uh, so I really thought that was a a great example of uh, of the advantages of that approach. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, it was a, a very uh, hard part of the consensus design uh, process that. Uh, uh, some of the panel members insisted on the Bayesian uh, approach, and some uh, members of the of the panel insisted on the frequentist approach. And uh, I was uh, just uh, cracking my mind how to accommodate uh, these, how to how to resolve this. And uh, I remember that uh, it came to me during a, a morning run uh, that uh, why don't we do both? And uh, the the solution was simply to to create a package of the frequentist and the Bayesian uh, hypothesis testing, and only proclaim the support for either model if both uh, have the same conclusion. And uh, thinking back, this is kind of obvious now, but uh, at the time we were always using either one. Yeah. Okay, um, Marcel. 
Yes, yes. Um, um, so EGA's uh, Epsilon is really, really small. And we have a lot of people in the world, huh? more than 7 billion. So why not trying to find those special people, if they exist, that can show ESP? Huh? That would be great, I think, if we can find these people, if they exist. And I, and I think uh, this is one of the, I'm not sure whether it was used in this particular uh, um, setup. So I'm sorry that I don't know this. But in general, uh, one approach is to uh, do a test, look at people who perform exceptionally well, and then test only those people again, right? And if they regress to the mean, then we know that it was a fluke. But if they don't regress to the mean, you know, then then they they uh, uh, then something special could be going on, and uh, it would be a much more effective use of resources to focus on the the, the people who show some promise in this regard. So, um, so in general, I think it's a good idea. Yes, I see in the Q and A that uh, Felix says. Uh, that this is a great demonstration of the uh, Duan Queen uh, problem. But uh, yeah, Felix, uh, you can probably speak to this question yourself. Uh, hi, sorry, I was not prepared to uh, to speak, but <laughs> yeah. So um, the, the the very first question of the symposium, where you ask about the the change in belief, and and also what EJ said in in his last comment. I think that's a nice illustration of the Druhim Quine problem because everybody can blame his or her favorite uh, auxiliary assumptions. Um, and if we all stay with our previous beliefs, so how can we change our beliefs at all if even such a study is not able to change your beliefs? So I mean, is that just a, is that just a function of your of the strength of your prior belief, which probably is very strong in this case? Um, and related to that, I have the impression that in many adversarial collaborations, most teams stay at their prior beliefs. Instead, uh, despite having these consensus protocols and so on. So are you aware of any adversarial, adversarial collaborations where the losing team actually changed their mind also in public? I I think I, I heard of one such uh, adversarial co collaboration uh, with uh, Kahneman being involved, where, where uh, the result kind of proved both sides a bit wrong, and there, there was like a third uh, outcome. But uh, I'm not really aware. I mean, uh, I'm not aware of the details. I should read up on this. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, I see that uh, we have well, two minutes left. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to mention that there was this recent uh, study with many experts who looked at ego depletion, and the results there were quite clear. And I think some people there changed their minds. And there was also the, uh, a collaborator of Amy Cuddy who changed her mind on uh, power posing, I think. So it does happen, but um, yeah. Uh, you know, we have these debates that have gone on for decades, right? Where one researcher advocates one theory, the other advocates the other theory, and miraculously, they always find support for their theory and against the theory of the adversary. So uh, it's kind of uh, almost funny. So this is a great uh, area to make progress on uh, how to how to change minds and uh, how to, or rather. Uh, how to make our experiments more effective in and more impactful in changing priors, maybe. Um, so, but with this note, I think we need to um, uh, close our session. I would like to thank uh, uh, all of you uh, in the panel, and of course, everyone in the uh, among the attendees who participated in this session. Um, and uh, let's uh, make progress in improving uh, science and trustworthiness of our research projects. Thank you all.